द प्रिंट ऑफ द कफ कॉर्पोरेट पार्टनर ए यू स्मॉल फाइनेंस बैंक हेलो एंड वेलकम टू दिस एडिशन ऑफ ऑफ द कफ और एज ओ टी सी सम वुड से दिस इज अ स्पेशल सेशन स्पेशल इन इन अ सेंस बिकॉज we have with us uh, a unique guest uh, who as you all know uh, is lieutenant general kgs dillon he is also known as tiny dillon uh, and uh, you can quite uh, see and find out for yourself that he is not as <laughs> tiny as one would really make in, in fact in, in fact to match up to him we should have both had sort of uh, the uh, cushions some elevators or cushions under our there you go you know we'll keep that in mind the next time and uh, he does not need any introduction he uh, is the former chief of the defense intelligence agency uh, for those who are not aware dia is actually a tri service uh, intelligence agency and is also uh, been the commander of the uh, srinagar uh, based 15 core and he's come out with his book uh, which is kitne gazi aaye kitne gazi gaye now this is a book that encapsulates his entire journey Uh, from a three-year-old uh, young boy to what to his entire career. Uh, so, welcome to the prince, sir. It's a pleasure having you over. Thank you, thank you, Sunesh. Thank you, Shakur. Tell us something before uh, get into the business end of it. How did you acquire this nickname? Because this is so uh, so counterintuitive. <laughs> Tiny Delo. Yeah. Tiny Delo. You are what? Six foot three. I am six foot three yeah. inches. Yeah. You you are the fast bowler. We. Missed. <laughs> <laughs> I think cricket's lost some is gain. <laughs> so the more serious note or lighter note rather. Yeah, tiny hello is a name which is with me for last almost now thirty nine forty years, and everyone in the army, officers, ladies and children, the grandchildren now, they all call me tiny or tiny uncle and uh, all that. The name was given when I joined my unit in December nineteen eighty three. Uh, my battalion, fourth battalion, the Rajputana Rifles, and in that unit there was a little uh, thing that any officer who joins, he used to be given a nickname, which is contrary to what his looks are. Oh, I see. <laughs> or what his intellect is. So my looks were six three, so I was given the name Tiny. Another officer six three, Shorty. Another officer six three, Mini. The most intelligent officer is called Goofy, <laughs> <laughs> and this name stays with you even on the radio set. we never use our call signs which are given in the press or the pamphlets we use tiny for shorty tiny for many tiny for goofy so this is how it works as you said it's cricket's laws army's game uh what really made you join the army is you know one would assume since you are from punjab everybody joins you know forge is what there but what is it that you and you mentioned this in your book uh but what made you join the army per se yes in punjab army or defense forces for that matter and more so army is a very preferred career option for the young boys even today and in those days all these different options and women also now yes women. women also women officers and the young girls are very very keen to join the armed forces and in my family my grandfather was in the army he had fought in the first world war and uh, my mama ji is i was brought up by my nani ji and my mama ji is uh, one elder one was a captain in the army and the younger one later on he switched to punjab government and the younger one was in bsf he retired as a dig from yeah. uh, bsf and i used to see them wearing uniform every day and that used to give a little high then i was studying in kendriya vidyalaya in frospur kent and most of my class fellows were sons or daughters of army officers or the jcos and jwans and uh, we had a class fellow in uh, school mr harish jang bahadur who was a fifth son of an army officer and his eldest for elder four brothers had all gone to india and he was hell bent on joining india so he filled the forms for the whole class for india and unfortunately he couldn't uh, clear but two of us cleared and joined india okay. so this is how and then my father didn't want to want me to join the army he had a very uh, nice business going and uh, he didn't want me to join army so i have joined the army under an agreement that after some time in india then he will take me out okay but i was very clear once i mean i am not coming out <laughs> <laughs> and the book idea of the book how did that come idea of the book this title kitne gazi aaye kitne gazi gaye 
This phrase was used in a press conference immediately after Pulwama, ID blast. And uh, when I superannuated on 31st January 2022, within about a week's time, Major Gaurav Arya was interviewing me for his channel. And he asked this question, sir, uh, are you thinking of writing a book? That is the first time this idea came up. So who used this uh, phrase at, in that press conference? You did. That is a press conference uh, which happened immediately after Palawama ID blast. And the module of Jashim Muhammad, which had carried out the Palawama ID blast, the leader of that module was a Pakistani terrorist by the name Kamran. His code name was Ghazi. And Ghazi is a very preferred code name by, for all the Pakistani terrorists. And even in my previous tenure, a lot of Pakistani terrorists with the code name Ghazi had been yeah. eliminated by us. So in this press conference, so after Pulwama, 14th February Pulwama happened. 18th February, we had eliminated this module. And 19th February morning, this press conference was there in Badamibad. So for the last four days, the local media was absolutely buzzing with Ghazi has done this, Ghazi has carried out this Pulwama blast. And Ghazi, Ghazi was made as a bigger than life uh, persona. So in the press conference, a journalist asked me, is Ghazi dead? I didn't want to give much credence to Ghazi. And then, of course, one had eliminated so many Ghazis in the past. So my one-liner was, Kitne Ghazi aaye, kitne Ghazi gaye. But one year, don't worry, we are there. So this line became viral. The youngsters picked up this line, all the company commanders and COB commanders. So they started putting this line, Kitne Ghazi aaye, kitne Ghazi gaye, on their company post gates. And then uh, social media picked up this line. And this guy line became, uh, you can say, synonymous with this photograph also, which is on the cover. Because this photograph is also from the same press conference. And that's how the title came. So how many tenures have, did you do in Kashmir? A total of uh, eight tenures in uh, counter-terrorism, counter -insurgency. Eight tenures? Eight. Seven of them in JNK, six of them in Kashmir. Starting with September 1988 as a young captain in North Kashmir. And the last tenure, of course, was a Chinar Corps commander. So you must have served in Kashmir at every rank? Yes, uh, Brigadier rank twice and Major General rank I missed out. And uh, Captain, Major, Major Lieutenant Lieutenant Colonel, Company Commander there? Yes. Battalion Commander also? Yes, Brigade Commander. Then Brigadier General Staff in the Corps Headquarter and then the Corps Commander. And the Corps Commander. Interesting, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, Lieutenant General Ojla uh, took over from you as the CEO of your unit and yes. he is currently the Corps Commander. Yes, the present uh, Corps Commander of 15 Corps, Lieutenant General Amardeep Singh Ojla. Yeah. He is from Rajdeep. I handed over my unit 15 Rajdeep as Commanding Officer to General Ojla. And that was in 2005. Yeah. And when I was the Corps Commander, General Ojla was a GOC 28 Devin Kupwada. Absolutely. And we were colleagues again. In between also, we had a lot of tenures together in Army headquarters. As a captain and major, we were together in a foreign tenure earlier than uh, handing over the unit to him. So we have a long association. So in the Army, you have this institutional memory because uh, the same people across many ranks have worked together. Uh, and this provides continuity. Yes, it provides continuity and it also provides a word of mouth repetition, mm -hmm. which is very important because the repetition on paper or your, you can say your achievements on paper may not tell the story of your real self. So the word of mouth is very important in the army and MS branch, the branch which deals with the HR and the postings and all, they take cognizance of word of mouth very, very seriously. And that's how people who have served together or people who have served in a particular area, they are the people who go back to the area as senior officers so that they know the ground pulse. So you know, you've uh, done multiple tenures in Kashmir. At any point of time, did you think that you will be a core commander? And also tell us about how did you become a core commander? I know the story behind it, you know, your interaction, but uh, you know, what uh, what happened? You know, how did you come to know that you're going to be appointed as the next core commander? To be very serious, to be very, you can say, uh, serious and uh, sure what I'm going to say. My ultimate vision or aim or you know, aspiration was, to become adjutant of four Rajdev. Four Rajdev. <laughs> that is my unit when I joined the army. And that is to rise to the rank of captain and sit on that uh, hallowed chair. Adjutant. adjutant is a very, very strong uh, very appointment. Very powerful Very position. powerful appointment in the battalion. So my aim was to become adjutant of four Rajdev to start with. And uh, when I came up for uh, becoming a corps commander, uh, in the army, the rank which you get is as per your seniority. Absolutely. So when I became a lieutenant general, in my own seniority, I picked up the rank whenever the vacancy fell vacant. 
However, the appointment is at the discretion of the chief and uh, other people who take the decision. So I was lined up at number nine or ten for my with my seniority to take over as a corps commander. Yeah. So with that lineup, if everything went as per seniority for the appointment, also I should have become a corps commander sometime in October two thousand nineteen. Yeah. So General Rawat, the late CDS, God bless his soul, he was the chief. And one late evening, I was briefing him on something, and uh, suddenly asked me, uh, "When is your uh, turn for the corps commander?" I said, "Sir, I am ninth or tenth in the waiting." Then he says, "Kashmir jaega." I said, "Yes, sir." He says, "Okay, go to Kashmir, command 15th Corps, and do a good job of it." So this is how he picked me up from number 10, sent me to Kashmir as corps commander. I took over. The Chinar Corps on 10th of February. Yeah. 14th of February, Pulwama happened, Pulwama. and thereafter, rest, as they say, is history. You know, your your book uh, mentions this uh, the Pulwama thing. You mentioned that within minutes of the Pulwama thing, you, you know, you of course you received the information, uh, and your tenure has seen very spectacular things, uh, Pulwama, Balakot. Uh, but one of the most important element, and which is there mentioned in the book, is also. the abrogation of article 370 and there were a lot of uh, nobody at that time there were a lot of speculation nobody really knew what was happening you know uh, and your book mentions this interesting breakfast meeting that you had what was this breakfast meeting and what was really discussed at that breakfast meeting your book doesn't give so much details you say it's, it's secret but at least you know tell us today this is uh, the honorable home minister mr amit shah was visiting kashmir and the jammu region on Home Minister, the Home Minister, Mr. Yeah. Amit Shah ji, on 26th and 27th of June 2019. That is good about 40 days before 5th yeah. of August 2019. Yeah. And 1st of July 2019, Shri Amarnath ji's yatra was to commence. Yeah. So on 26 June, when the Honorable Home Minister came to Kashmir, we had a meeting where all the stakeholders, the civil administration, DGP, army, and other uh, Northern uh, agents, army commander, Northern army commander was also present. The CRPF head and other people were there. Chief secretary was there. Governor sir was there. So there was a routine two three meetings we had on 26 June afternoon, where security was discussed. The Amarnath Yatra security was discussed. Other overall uh, situation was discussed. A lot of people gave their uh, briefings and inputs. And these meetings lasted till about 11:30, 12 in the night. So I got back home on 26th June night at about 11:30, 12. There was a birthday of uh, one general officer, General Chuhan. He had invited me for dinner that day. So I went to his house at 12:30 in the night, had a piece of cake, wished him, came back to my house, home, or uh, the Chinar house, and at two in the night I get a call. Uh, there is a breakfast meeting tomorrow morning at seven o'clock. I said, okay, I'll be there. Then at three o'clock I get a call again. Uh, what would you like to have for breakfast? So that is when I said, "Baki jo khayenge, wo ham bhi khalenge." I will have whatever the others will eat. That is when somebody, that gentleman, told me, "No, it's only between you and the home minister. It's a one-on-one -on -one breakfast meeting." And uh, anyway, fero, khane wale ka to bhul gaye. So then it came down. Okay, why? When I went there at seven in the morning, of course, home minister was. Gracious enough to serve dhokla, aloo ka pranthas, and other things, and that meeting lasted, I think, about 45 minutes to one hour. In that, although one did not know what is coming, there are a lot of uh, buzz in the air that something is going to yeah. happen to 35A or 370 or bifurcation, yeah. trifurcation. So a lot of things got discussed slowly and slowly. Things started clearing up. What if some action is taken? What can happen? There were people in Kashmir who were saying, "Khun ki nadiyan beh jayengi, lashen beh jayengi, tarange ko kanda dene wala koi nahi hoga, LC ko par ye ho jayega, wo ho jayega." And lot of everything to everything was discussed on the line of control. What are the contingencies? What are the eventualities which can happen? Are we prepared for it? How much is the you know thing we have in the internal situation? What can happen? Can the unrest go out of hand? Will there be a mutiny in a particular force? how will we handle the mass unrest so all this situation and contingencies were discussed i given the details in the book also and my views were taken as to how will you handle it and i for one was very sure and i given the background in the book we are read and as to why my confidence was so high 
that we can handle it and synergy between all the security forces army jammu kashmir police crpf intelligence agencies civil administration was so high was so high and good that nothing we would have allowed to go wrong and we had few events or incidents in the recent past which gave us the confidence that we will not allow things to go out of hand so that is where uh, when final thing he asked me how do you think we should go so my uh, reply was agar kisi ko itihas likhna hai to kisi na kisi ko itihas banana padega if you have to write history someone has to make history and that was well taken and of course uh, rest is history and one is part of it and we wrote it and uh, proud of it so were you surprised by uh, the reaction on the ground was it more than what you had expected or less than what you had expected like i said the uh, reaction on the ground we had catered for all the eventualities and there were people who were saying so many casualties will happen you know it will become uncontrollable but we within our the security forces team we were very clear things will not allowed to go out of hand because our common kashmiri was fed up of uh, hartal every day the killings every day the mass unrest every day his life getting disturbed he has to get back home by 5 his earnings are curtailed the tourism is not happening his summer installments are not being paid his schools are remaining closed for 280 days his child is not getting educated there are a lot of socio economic political aspects which were hurting our common kashmiri a common kashmiri who had nothing to do with anything he wanted peace and that is the pulse we had felt because we had interact with lot of people on ground and now anyone can say or everyone in fact congratulates you that you maintained peace the lives are not lost the property was not uh, damaged but we were sure it will not allowed to be happening this will not be allowed to happen so peace was we were very sure it will be maintained of course one or incident here and there we were also keeping our fingers crossed but i think it is the people of kashmir who made it possible and they are going to reap the dividends of uh, this peace in future you know that brings me a some of our viewers because we have put it out had sent in those questions and we'll take the viewers questions and one of the question that uh, first question is actually connected to this only and uh, is actually by uh, rahul manoj and uh, he, and he's you know he's talking about uh, the kashmir and the latest there were some reports which have now said that there could there is a possibility of army being withdrawn and the security of jammu and kashmir being given to uh, the crpf uh, as a former co commander as the man who interacted with amit shah uh, with the home minister do you think it's it's time for the army to move out of uh, jammu and kashmir in terms of Uh, internal security internal security or should it thin out see a uh, assessment of security situation or analysis of the security situation how grim it is or how good it is it's a very continuous process and it's a very dynamic process we cannot uh, take situation on a particular day without visualizing the future thing which are likely to happen in case we take a call today so the people on ground have to analyze and uh, there is no difference i'll tell you when we were uh, i was operating even today i am in touch with the security team there is no difference everyone calls themselves security forces we do not differentiate between the uniform of the color of the uniform there is a army convoy which moves through whole of kashmir it goes towards baramulla goes towards uh, tangdhar kupwara and then towards yeah. bandipura and other places so there is a presence of army all over there is a movement of army all over similarly the presence of crpf and jammu kashmir police all over and the movement of crpf and bsf all over so assessment of the security situation is not a daily basis thing it's a long term perspective has to be taken into consideration we have lost enough kashmiri lives we have lost enough lives of security personnel we cannot allow the situation to slip out of our hand so whatever decision the people on ground take they must take into cognizance what can happen and if that happens then how we are going to control it it should end state must be very clearly defined without knowing your end state you rush into a decision this way or that way i am not the one for these things so i have a question from uh, hari rao s hari rao who is a retired citizen ex csir 
Council of Scientific and Industrial Research and he says, he asks, Sir, will terrorism in Kashmir never end? With Pakistan in serious trouble, who's funding the drones and terrorists in Kashmir? Is it any group within India or some other non-friendly country? See, specifically about drones and terrorism from across the border by Pakistan, all these activities are funded from Pakistan. How it doesn't require that much yeah. funds. Yeah, it doesn't require the drone is a very commonly available. You can buy it online uh, portals and other things. And uh, high end drones, of course, require more money. But those are the not one which they're using. They're using them at the planes level only. Having said that, there is an ecosystem in Kashmir, which always existed. There is a terrorist. There is a ISA backed elements. There are overground workers. There is Hurriyat or there was a Hurriyat. Then there are certain politicians, the local vernacular press also in that, who are benefiting from this uh, situation which is not so good or not peaceful in Kashmir. Cottage industry have up information there for the security forces. Ko, ja, for Cisco. Mm. And there are people who have made, uh, you know, multi-story pakka houses out of this cottage industry. Out of giving information to the armed forces. Oh, to the security forces. And getting paid for it. And getting paid for it. So I call it cottage industry, but they have three months of pakka makaan. Ban gaye. <laughs> so, so having said that, this ecosystem. Haan, agar ye problem khatam ho jai, unka to unka to business model khatam ho jai. So they are not in, interested in the situation getting diffused. So notwithstanding that, having said that, the situation now is at a very, very, terrorism is at very low ebb. Consolidation has to take place. I was discussing with Mr. Shekhar uh, before we started the discussion. Three things have to go concurrently. One is, Whatever gains have been made, whatever peace has been achieved, we cannot allow it to slip away. And this has a relationship to the previous question. Should a particular force be removed by another force? So we cannot allow the gains already made to slip away. We have to consolidate those gains. The citizens must start feeling the dividends of peace. Second is hard oppression or hard action must continue to eliminate the terrorism once and for all. But that's only about 10% of the job. 90% is to bring, you can say, circle to the public, to make people, you know, soft power. The education has suffered, the job creation has suffered, the income has suffered, the medicine, medical facilities have suffered, hygiene, sanitation has suffered, infrastructure has suffered, banking have suffered. All these things have suffered. Tourism has suffered. Kashmir is an agrarian society. The fruits, the crops have suffered. So this needs to be put in place so that a normal Kashmiri earns his livelihood and his son does not waver towards terrorism. So there's a job in progress. It has to be dealt at three levels. Third level which I described is 90% of the effort or focus. So there's a question from Ryan Sheikh, student. I don't know where he's from. He's asking a question about radicalization of young kids in Kashmir. Are we doing enough at the institutional level to prevent this or to run de-radicalization programs to get them back in mainstream? What can we do better in this area? Radicalization is a very live problem. And if I say radicalization has not happened or is not happening, I will be wrong. I will accept radicalization is there. There is a proper infrastructure which is behind this. And there is an ecosystem, like I told you, you don't get good education. What did the uh, Pakistani terrorists do in 1989-90? When Kashmiri Pandits left, Kashmiri Pandits were the mainstay of education system. May it be a primary school, high school, high secondary, or in colleges. When they left, they burnt all the schools in the on the countryside, which were made of the wood, uh, wooden structures those days, so that the child doesn't go to school. Now, if a child is not educated, when he, and then came the Hartali door. Every day there's a Hartal school that closed down for 280 days out in a year. The child has not attended the school in the whole academic session. Suddenly the final exams come. He is promoted in mass, the whole class, to the next class. Now this was okay, fifth, seventh, ninth. When they came to 10th and 12th, because the educational background was the base was not there, they could not compete to get into a good engineering college, good medical college or good professional college. And that is where then came the terrorism, the tourism was affected and other things. The income was not there. Job creation was not there. Outsiders were not allowed to come in because of Article 35A. MNCs did not come in. And this coincided with 1990 when India opened up to the world on the economic front. 
1990 terrorism started in Kashmir. When rest of India was, you know, improving the economic status, Kashmir was going down. So education was going down, job creation was going down. The child was could not get into a good college. He is 18 years of age, 17 years of age. He is frustrated. He was a cannon fodder for the terrorist, and he was a very live candidate for radicalization. The point which you made: radicalization can be removed if we give good education. Then the child knows he has a chance of getting into a good college. He has a chance of getting a good job. Then he will not go towards this radicalization machinery. Another question uh, that has come to uh, that has been put forward is by Dr. Ramesh Kumar uh, Pandita. and is asking considering the present situation in pakistan this at its worst could over a period of time to fragmentation and independence of its constituencies uh fall out of that scenario uh do you where do you see this the ties with pakistan do we have a ceasefire that is on for the last 2 years but the fear uh, among many sides is that you know once pakistan is able to stabilize itself you know things will again heat up how do you see this uh, are we running on a short time period here there are two aspects to this issue about pakistan one is pakistan is down economically pakistan is in political mess pakistan's diplomatic status is near zero and pakistan military is accused of all types of corruption allegations this is the first time in the history of independent pakistan after 47 that pakistan army is openly being abused on the roads and pakistan army is under attack from a leader who's very popular on the road the street so there are these the four pillars of any country's uh, might political economic military and diplomacy in addition to others so all these four pillars in pakistan are crumbling pehli baar ho raha hai ki pakistan ke mujahiron mein ye jo jo gundagardi hai iske piche wardi hai it has never happened you have covered ye, ye pakistan ye jo dehshat gardi hai ye jo dehshat gardi hai iske piche wardi hai so it has never happened in the past so pakistan is on a downward trend wahan pe you see the pakistani rupee visa vis dollar you see the prices of petrol you see the prices of daily goods essentials uh, which we use at home like chai patti atta and other things so pakistan is in dollar terms there is a uh, sort sort of people who say if pakistan is going down we should help it go down further that is one way of looking at it if he is an enemy once like you said once he reemerges he is going to create a problem Beggar again my neighbor no yeah Beggar. and second is you cannot choose your neighbors we are stuck with it it's better to have a stabilized peaceful progressive neighbor who has learned its lessons and we wish pakistan well because we wish pakistani people well the deep state is the enemy of the country the establishment is what is creating all the problems so from their point of view i will say when the patient is recovering repeat the dose we should help it crack but for the good of pakistani people who have nothing to do with this we must wish for a peaceful stable progressive pakistan in future which is in overall interest of the nation in future is the key word that you mentioned yes because today's pakistan is uh, not very friendly to india संदीप सिंह संधू हु एक्स मर्चेंट ने भी इतने सवाल आए हैं कि हमारे को अपने पूछने का तो मौका ही नहीं मिलना है आज एंड दे नो दैट यू आर इन कश्मीर एंड यू ऑल्सो लेट डी आई एस दे आर नॉट कन्फाइनिंग यू टू द गाजी इशू सो ही वॉन्ट्स टू नो हिज वर्ड्स नॉट माई वर्ड्स एंड आई कोट विथ चाइनीज ऑक्यूपाइंग डेपसांग प्लेन एंड स्टॉपिंग इंडियन आर्मी फ्रॉम पेट्रोलिंग बियॉन्ड वाई जंक्शन that we know is true what are the army's options in ladakh see army since i have been a chief of defense intelligence agency there is too much which i know and those things cannot be told because those will those will go to grave along with me right having said that china is an enemy which understands only strength you be goody goody with china they will keep mounting on you you show them strength that what we did uh, in august uh, 2020 and once we occupied that rangla ridge that is the type of strength chinese understand so as an indian army the options are very very clear our options are only very strong options and we have the where with all today there is no way we are a indian army or india of yesterday we cannot accept bully bullish behavior from any neighbor we are one fifth of the world we are the fifth largest economy of the world we have the strongest standing army in the region so we we are well trained well acclimatized to fight in high altitude areas 
نو ٹیکنالوجی ورکس تھے صرف جگرا کام کرتا ہے وہاں پہ اینڈ آور سولجرز آور بٹالینز آور یونٹس ہیو بین ان ہائی ٹوڈے ایئر ایور سنس وی آر ناٹ کنسکرپٹس آف سیونٹین ایئرز ایج اور ایٹین ایئرز ایج جن کو ماں کی یاد آتی ہے وی آر ہارڈ اینڈ سولجرز سو آور آپشنز آر وی مسٹ پلے ٹو آر اسٹرینتھ آور اسٹرینتھ از آور اسٹرانگ آرمی ان دو ان دوز ریجنس سو واٹ ایگزیکٹلی از ہیپننگ ان ڈیپس آرمی سی آئی وڈ ناٹ لائک ٹو بیکاز دا گورمنٹ آفیشیل ورژن وچ از دیئر ناؤ دیٹ سنس آئی ایم آؤٹ آؤٹ آف دا یونیفارم آئی نو ایز مچ ایز یو نو سو آئی گو بائی دا آفیشیل ورژن اینڈ دیٹس اٹ یو سرو ان کشمیر ایز یو سیٹ چائنا از آر اینمی اینڈ دیٹس ور دیٹ یوز Uh, and there is a rebalance that has now taken place, a refocus. You know, personally, I'm very happy with the refocus that, is, that has happened. As you as a uh, military man, you know, who's, who's seen conflicts, who's seen action, is this the right thing that India is doing? The rebalance, rebalance as in the refocus from the Western front to the Northern front, to the Northern neighbor, which is China. You know, uh, we've, we've moved a strike core uh, to the Northern side. Uh, there are multiple other changes that have taken place. Is this the right thing to do? See, I've served four tenures in a directorate called Perspective Planning. And including as a major of legal left uncle, then brigadier, then major general. Then as a left uncle, I headed that directorate before I went to 15th Corps. The, that directorate, in addition to other things like finance, uh, budgeting and weapon systems, technology, you know, it looks at strategy in the long term perspective, 15 years hence. So, Looking at the enemies, looking at your threats, looking at your strengths, looking at your options is a very evolving and a dynamic process which every military does. If you keep looking at the enemy of 1960s and you are in 2023, you are doomed. So you have to keep looking at the threats which are emerging, the threats which are likely to emerge in the next 15 to 20 years. So with that visualization, Indian Army or Indian Defense Forces looked at the threat was emerging more from a particular side and they did the rebalancing. There were some new raising which happened. There's a rebalancing of existing resources or assets which happened so that we are able to uh, handle both the fronts or other two and a half fronts as uh, late General Rawat used to say. So we have to keep evolving and this is not the final thing. Now this is not cast in stone. Again, the, somebody will uh, do the analysis, do the assessment and you never know it might get more rebalanced or it might get uh, back to a little bit this side or that side. So it's nothing fixed. It's a evolving, it's a dynamic process. Every army does it. So we have a uh, question from again from uh, A. Vishwam, uh, ADCI, um, and uh, from ADCI. I'm, uh, uh, and the question is, it seems to me that China's incursions in the Himalayan area are des- designed to be a distraction to reprioritize our military spend away from the Indian Ocean region. Our naval ambitions, including a third, could potentially make us a naval including superpower. Including a third carrier. Including a third carrier could potentially make us a naval superpower that could disrupt China's energy supply. Are we being distracted from this? Again, a fine balance between the naval assets, the air assets, and the ground assets. We have two nuclear enemies, which are on the northern and the western border, and most of the borders are along the ground. But our presence in Indian Ocean our Andaman Nicobar Islands, our Lakshadweep Islands and the Malacca Strait and all, the trade which passes through Indian Ocean. Strong Navy is very, very important. The number of aircrafts, one can keep uh, discussing this, but Andaman Nicobar Islands is a static aircraft carrier right in the middle of Indian Ocean, which has the strike capability going up to Malacca Strait or even uh, towards the west, towards the east. So, and then air to air refueling we have. We have adequate potential militarily, I will say, militarily. When I say militarily, it involves yeah. Army, Navy, Air Force. And again, there is a balance. The kitty is the same. Who gets what is again the prioritization, which is done at the CDS uh, level. And everything is being catered for all three forces, which are the requirement for the national defense. Before we go to the other questions, you spent uh, several tenures in operational regions. Uh, right from the cutting edge ranks, Captain, Major. Tell us about a couple of interesting incidents, encounters that took place. Actually, there are a lot of anecdotes in the book. Yes, yes. There are a lot of anecdotes so in the book. Don't call them anecdotes. Those are lived experiences. <laughs> they are lived experiences. And I have narrated a lot of them. Some of them are hilarious. No one can uh, laugh at it. So, uh, but uh, Tell us your favorite <laughs> ones. Uh, favorite one? 
actually every situation was a life and death situation right uh, but uh, where uh, i came most close to the terrorist fire or something is again narrated in the book it was in manipur and manipur got, manipur and uh, i was a major there at what 11 in the night i got a call from my ceo it was the month of july it was raining and maybe uh, posted in, in i was in uh, chura chandpur district okay. in the, in the, in the, generally the area which is now seeing trouble yes it was always uh, trouble zobi tribes koki tribes yes, yes. koki is how and uh, maites and paites all the tribes are there and those were the days uh, you know it was 1997 and when if you remember lot of villages right. were burned down so my area had about 50 odd villages most of them were burned down when i went there as a company commander and uh, so my ceo gave information at about 11 in the night there are 40 insurgents uh, in a particular village and he also said that i don't think it is true but ek bar check kar le and my wa- reply was sir i have known this village it's a uh, you know uh, earlier uh, it used to be a training ground for a particular uh, terrorist group i said this information is true and he also told me they are they have universal machine guns there are some girls also in that so anyway we that village was on top of a hill so i had my troops uh, i said okay what i'll do is i'll take 10 boys with me very lightly equipped we will run to the village we'll strike the village and they will run down after that once we hit them we wanted to hit them before the day break and the day uh, you know is very early very early in, in uh, uh, northeast yeah. so i had strong ambushes at the base of that hillock in all five six directions where the pagdandis were coming down or foot tracks were coming down so when i hit this village at 4:30 in the morning the fire fight started our dog got hit and uh, we were just about not even 15 20 meters from the insurgents and he is on top i am down below and uh, he is firing down on me and i can see him he can see me we both are looking at each other in the eye but his fire is not hitting me and uh, i have been an instructor in infantry school teaching weapon system weapons personal weapon or machine gun and there's something called plunging fire hmm. when you aim a weapon you cater for the gravitational pull hmm. Hmm. so you don't aim a weapon directly on the right. target you right. aim it slightly high Right, so the bullet goes up in a trajectory and then the gravity pulls it down and at the given range it goes and hits the target so the weapon that designed for this trajectory in the planes now this chap is firing down at me but the trajectory is taking the bullets away from me and the gravity is taking it further away this concept is called plunging fire i explained in the book now he is firing down at me and he is seeing me but he is not able to hit me but or anyway, we fired some other weapon system and then the chase continued for 3 days the beauty of this encounter was i taught plunging fire to the young officer for 3 years but this is the first time i experienced what is plunging fire and that too from the target end <laughs> <laughs> so so theory the lesson learned is theory is never complete unless you have the practical experience so if he had learned plunging fire from yeah. you if he had learned he would have hit me <laughs> <laughs> and and tell us some example from kashmir you were telling me about one your first one when you were still quite when indian army was also quite innocent also. yeah yeah okay it is the i think this was 1988 i was you got commissioned in 83 yeah i got commissioned in 83 i was a young captain 1988 i was traveling in a jeep from kupwara towards chokibal there is a very famous uh, mata khir bhawani temple in tikkar there is one mata khirbani temple uh, in uh, near bandipura also and uh, tulmul and this at uh, tikkar also there is a very famous mata khirbani temple and we were crossing this village tikkar and it was day time maybe afternoon 233 and suddenly we heard someone firing some firing happening and i asked my driver i said yahan pe to koi fauj bhi nahi hai firing range bhi nahi to ye firing kahan se ho rahi hai suddenly we saw a chap about 2 300 meters on top of a hill trying to fire with an ak on to us and since uh, we were new we didn't have much experience of uh, you know f- counter terrorist operation the driver stopped the vehicle we got down from the vehicle open <laughs> in the open in broad sunlight and we are looking at him he is again not trying to fire and we can see certain specks of dust where the bullets are coming and hitting of course ak47 at 300 meters may not be very effective will not be very effective but that is how we were and you know that bullet could have hit anywhere at the softer portion so one would have died also but that is how we learnt our lessons 
today's operations in kashmir are carried out with such surgical precision that minimum loss of life towards the civilian and on minimum loss or collateral damage to the property and maximum precision elimination of the terrorist so we have come a long long way and there are many anecdotes like this one i had in uh, first encounter in my life where we stopped during a patrol and there were a few huts just about uh, 200 meters away it was near the line of control in the lockat se lockat bangas both bangas se a beautiful place and we stopped and boys wanted to make tea so do teen ladke idhar chale gaye do teen ladke idhar chale gaye there are terrorists sitting in those huts they thought we are trying to encircle them they opened up from the huts we opened up from this side and the fire fight continued but no damage but now we know we never halt in the open areas now wherever we halt we decide beforehand as to that place we are going to halt people go and secure that area we halt there we are under proper cover and even if we have to take a rest or take a break it's a very very tactical thing but those days we were also learning things and uh, now it's much better you know um, you you've been in the perspective planning and you spoke about uh, how the army has also evolved over a period of time and you talked about uh, weapon systems so we have a question coming in from vijay balan and he's asking and this is a very uh, important question and he says would you agree that one of india's biggest security challenges is its ponderous and overtly bureaucratic procurement system that often delivers too little and and way too late india has repeatedly missed R- rma which is the revolution military affairs business uh, the hollow sc- you know so will our procurement tardiness ensure we will miss the next rma as well if, you know you've been there you've served and we've spoken about it in the past also uh, is is that a frustration which comes in what can be done I, i'll partially agree with this question because uh, the defense procurement procedure since i have also been in perspective planning i have also been in weapon and equipment directorate as a colonel before i went as a brigadier to valley so it was very frustrating the defense procurement procedure was designed in those days and after tehlka actually the dpp came up after tehlka so in those days the dpp was designed not to procure weapons it was designed not to have anyone doing any hanky panky it was designed on to, the presumption that everybody everybody is a thief, is a thief. thief. but again over the last 20 years now first dpp i think came up in 2002 yeah. over the last 20 21 years lot of refinements have happened and now with lot of uh, emphasis on atmanirbhar and make in india lot of industry defense industry within india including the r and d so there is lot of things happening in that and since we are now over emphasizing on buying from an indian defense industry things have steamed down a lot and things have sorted out a lot but this point which is making was definitely an issue there was definitely a bottleneck because there so many approvals which one had to take and the dealing desk officer the poor lieutenant colonel he had to answer at least 33 people i think i had once counted them every time there is a doubt on that particular file ultimately the doubt has to be cleared by this dealing officer so there are a lot of uh, problems but now things have steamed out and streamlined and it is now working well especially the make in india so a couple of questions from my young colleagues sujeet veer singh biggest lesson for indian army from ukraine conflict biggest lesson from ukraine conflict is never venture into a war unless your end state or your end aim is very clear second lesson is the battle in built up area the fighting in built up area is not as easy as it seems as india discovered in jaffna yes as india discovered in uh, oppavan and now our learning lessons is way too high or above the other armies because we are actually may not be fighting conventional battle in built up area but we are fighting counter terrorism counter insurgencies in built up areas which are partially kachcha partially pakka or wholly pakka and very congested lanes and by lanes so in a built up area one sniper can hold up a company for 8 to 10 hours properly sighted with ammunition he will jump from window to window building to building roof to roof and when a large column moves they expose themselves in addition to that is when you plan your offensives the fighting forces the teeth can reach to survive the teeth element there logistics must fetch up and to secure the lines of logistics 
is very important, which again, the Russians uh, suffered losses in that. So go step by step, not, I'm not saying go sequentially. I'm saying eat up, link up, eat up, link up. Mm -hmm. Secure your area properly, because now it's more than a year. The area secured is only that much. It could have been consolidated in much fact, better. If anything, uh, it's lessened. Yes, lessened. Yes. So it's it's very important. And then fighting technology is one thing. But again, I will say, Gurda or the Dil Johanna, that is very important. Your heart has to be in what you are doing. When you're fighting but sir, for there's another point. Uh, when people of a country fight to defend themselves yes. uh, and they are motivated and committed, then it's that much tougher for a much superior army to win also. Yes, it's, it's, it's a fact because at the end of the day, the soldier, the weapon system is as good as the soldier be behind it. Soldier is the most important weapon system. Soldier is the man who will make a difference in winning and losing. So I agree with you there. So Raghav Big Chandani, again, my young colleague, uh, given political instability in Pakistan, uh, would you be of the opinion that this is a good moment for India to engage with Balochistan and POK? See, I, I will, again, partially this question has been answered. But Baluch Freedom Movement is an indigenous, indigenous movement and they are fighting it for far too long. We must support them morally, ethically, you know, in every which way, so that their freedom movement remains strong and achieves their aim. I agree with the, the Blue Freedom Movement because we must do to the enemy what enemy does to us. The pain of doing business, what Pakistan has been doing with us for the last more than 30, 40 years in different states, the pain must be felt by Pakistan. But this is not, you don't see it as perpetuating a blood feud. No, I'm saying it's a freedom moment. We, we support the Blood feud, uh, if we support them, then uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just giving you a, a possibility. Then Pakistan can pick up something else. Say Punjab, for example. No, he has only done it for last 40 years. Now it's a payback time. He has been doing it to India for last 40 years. So it's a legitimate thing to support a freedom moment. Sir, before we let you go, uh, no question, but the last one, uh, you gave us those two incidents. I I will uh, use my editorial discretion and cut out anecdote. Those are lived experiences. Tell us about one more, maybe when you were a bit senior, when you had your troops on the ground in a tough situation. Tell us about one of those experiences and then we can we'll let you go home. Okay, this is again uh, narrated in the book. Actually, in the book, there are a lot of uh, yes, sir, live incidents. We, we, uh, and we that's where we are coming yeah. from. And this one is, I was a uh, major in uh, North Kashmir, Lola. I was a very senior major. And uh, CO had uh, gone on leave and I was officiating CO. So there's a young captain who had uh, just joined. And, and Lolab is a very tough area. Very tough area. And uh, I've been in all these tough areas. I've been uh, Handwara, Hafruda, Lolab, Tral. All my tenures have been in these areas. So that young captain had joined and he had, so I thought I must visit that young captain, give him little, well, this was his first time in Kashmir. So I, as an officer CEO, went to that post and just to check on him and, you know, give him that little bit of a hosla, everything is okay and this, that. So when I went there, uh, I will not take long, but uh, I told them to, okay, you know, set it right that in case in the night there is some firing or something, so we will be able to answer that fire well. Details are given in the book. So suddenly at about, I think 11, 30, 12 in the night, the post was fired upon. Those were the days of Fidain, when the terrorist, fully armed terrorist would enter inside a post and then come and kill your people inside the post. And he, in any case, would uh, get killed subsequently. So Fidain ke din the wo 99 ki baat hai. And uh, immediately after Kargil. So when I went to that post at about 11, 30, 12 in the night, the terrorists started firing on the post. You were there? I was there inside the post. I was spending the night in that post. And I was wearing that uh, Pathani suit, yes. Salwar Kameej. And I immediately picked up the weapon. And I ran out, basically, you know, to control the situation. And when I was going past the cookhouse, we call it Langar. When I was going past the cookhouse, I heard some uh, rifle cocking noise. And that is when I realized that uh, I am not in a proper uh, dress. 
So <laughs> you I don't <laughs> smart fire at you. <laughs> so I ran back. I ran back to the room. I on the top of that salwar kameez or the pathani suit. I wore my trousers and jacket. <laughs> and, and I came out anyway. That fire stopped after 45 odd minutes. Uh, and once the fire stopped, everyone was now trying to check: has any fidain or a terrorist entered the post? Entered the post. So everyone is saying, "Sir, my area, my area, my area, my area, my area." And we were. taking all okay report and uh, suddenly this cook says ke sir nahi fidai na hai andar hai and he say salwar kameez mein tha and he say teen inch ka tha 6 foot ka 6.5 foot ka terrorist ye lambi lambi daadi haath mein ek ke pathani suit pehna hua and he is giving all the description which fits the description of a terrorist and everyone is believing him and when i saw that little shmodul there and i walked up to that place i said kya ho raha hai kehta sahab cook bol raha hai ke isne dekha hai one terrorist has entered or fadain has entered so when i you know spoke to him i was still wearing that jacket and plus, uh, trouser over that suit pathani suit so then i told him i removed that i said ye wala tha so so he said yeah sir then of course uh, but these things happen and and he saying he said meri to rifle nahi ko koi nahi to maine to maar liya hota and it, this would have been probably the first time a cook has killed a terrorist <laughs> <laughs> so there are a lot of anecdotes in this book kitne gazi aaye kitne gazi gaye this is the old saying no hang on to your tough times because yes. tomorrow there will be a good old days Absolutely. so you also see those good old days here even though it, some of these were near things yes when i read them or when i you know sort of look back at them yes they were very very near things the other incidents also and very very near things and uh, but now one can uh, laugh at it but this happens Well, thank you very much. As you know, I, as you can see, we can go on talking forever, but you have other stuff to do besides the fact that you have guests coming home, and uh, and you are obviously uh, more organized than us and more punctual than us. So we'll let you go. Thank you very much. Been such so such much. a privilege. Thank such you. a privilege. Thank you. Thank you. The print of the cuff. Corporate partner AU Small Finance Bank.